Notes from the Nest, written and read by Kurt Brecht. Picking through the trash on a Tuesday night. Might find nothing, then again I might. Half an onion bagel, or maybe a rotten peach. For some, a true treasure is still within reach. The lazy gears of my mind grind on sad spokes of my soul. I sleep in a nest, in a tree in Golden Gate Park. I'm not a bird or a squirrel, but I do eat seeds, nuts, fruit, and bread. I'm not sure what I am. Nevertheless, I'm not a suit and tie guy. In fact, shit, I'm a vocalist for a hardcore thrash band, the dirty, rotten imbeciles, making me an actual published poet. These are my notes from the nest. You will see, I'm hella tree smart, man on the move. See me quickly de-evolve under special circumstances in the perfect prehistoric climate of the park. I instantly adapted to simian life among the smooth, clean branches of the giant monument fir. I'm between tours, between albums, between women, between places to stay. So I live in a goddamn nest. But this is not just your average human nest. No, this is a living wood pseudo womb, a natural form, safe sleeping place high up in the motherly bowels. I am secret like Dr. Sachs. I'm a stealthy elf from Texas, swinging my spiked ball and chain like a barbed wire lasso and screaming at the top of my black and bleeding lungs. Look into my eyes. Tell me what you see. Amplified starlight, pure energy. You cringe from my power. Go home and take a shower. I'm intelligent life. You are less. Look into my heart. Tell me what you feel pain and agony from a horrid ordeal. You flee from my sadness, finding no gladness. I can handle it okay. You really can't. Look into my mind. Tell me what you think of the mange and madness of a missing link. You stiffen and turn sour, descending from my tower. You fall and turn away. You are mine. Yes, I have a nest, and like a true tree dweller, I go to ground only to gather food. The food is free at the local soup kitchen, a mere 10 minutes walk away, and I have only to be there at noon to receive a healthy vegetarian feast capable of sustaining me for the day. The soup kitchen, as it is called by its patrons, is the focal point of the day for many a park dweller and the only means of survival for most of them. Now and then I pass their cardboard and rotten blanket beds among the bushes as I make my way to the hate and wonder if maybe they would resent me if they knew I slept on a lounge chair cushion and inside a warm, never-touch-the-dirt sleeping bag, safe and out of the reach of the dew, slugs, cops, and pissing dogs. I am an outlaw among outlaws. It's against the law to sleep in the park and against the rules to sleep in the tree. I do both, and I know I'm right. I'm like a cockroach, a realist. I don't know how to lie. Prophetic pestilence, and there's a million more from where I came. So, here I lie and solemnly smoke my herb with religious regularity from my tiny Popeye pipe, whipping up the winds of that raging word storm in my brain, so to speak. Too many ugly words blowing around up there, wanting out but just having to wait in line like yours truly, single file, no cuts, at the soup kitchen. I write them down as they come. I read up here also. Recently I've digested the crucial ramblings of Henry Miller, Jack Kerouac, Arthur Rimbaud, Baudelaire and a multitude of lesser artists. I suck them in and spit them out. Simple. I feel I should give you a little background info. If you've read this far, you may be curious as how I came to find this nest and later to actually live in it. Well, I'll tell you. It was purely by accident that I came upon this wondrous person perch in which I now recline. Kenny Jones, alias the Carbohydrate Kid, and I discovered the tree during a between soup kitchen wander back when the Zoop Kitchen was being remodeled and the meals were served at Kizar Stadium. Ever since that glorious day, we have made it our duty to visit this nest and lie in it, enjoying its hospitality. About a year after we found the nest, someone built an artificial roost for the owl, which to this day lives below me only 20 feet down the tree. This harsh geometric landing is littered with large dog-like bird feces and the remains of small prey such as snails and mice. Anyway, 
It was from the owl that we got the idea of living in the tree. Then, by accident one day, I fell asleep here, awaking hours later feeling completely refreshed. Eventually, Kenny moved back to Texas, making the back of his truck unavailable as a crash pad. And Julie, who had always been good for a shower and floor space for a night, moved back to Sacramento. For a while, I slept in the band's van, but that was out in Oakland and the soup kitchen is in SF, so the train fare was killing me. After a mini tour to Canada, I rented a sleazy hotel room on Mission Street for $10 a night. I enjoyed the privacy, but knew I couldn't afford it for long. I talked the band into renting a storage space to stash all my gear, packed my warmest clothes in a small vinyl carrying case, bought a Walkman-style tape recorder, and moved up here. For the first few nights, I had no blanket and relied solely on alcohol to numb the cold wind which cut through my clothing. I drank beer and got drunk. Then this nice woman who my sister-in-law introduced me to gave me a sleeping bag and I haven't been cold since. Now that you know how I got here and why, I could continue with my observations. The mad woman sells shrunken heads for a dollar an ounce. For an extra five, you may purchase one that will bounce. I guess the description of the tree would be in order before continuing so that your mental picture will be more vivid as I tell my truth. Because, like I said before, the truth is all I can tell. The tree is a monument planted in memory of some dumb fuck whose name I can't remember because I haven't looked at the engraved stone plaque which sits under the ceiling of the lower branches of the side closest to the tree lately. The sturdy, evenly placed branches start about three feet from the ground and are as easy to climb as an elementary school jungle gym. It's the perfect climbing tree, healthy, clean, not a lot of sticky oozing sap, tall, and totally cloaked in green needled sprigs, each tipped with a tiny green cone. No one can see in here from a distance. In fact, you'd have to be standing directly beneath the tree to see up where I am, some 50 or 60 feet up. At the base of the trunk sits a large dumpster-shaped box, once used to hold gardening tools belonging to the park, but which now has been abandoned. I thought of sleeping in there, but I figured I would be far too vulnerable. To sleep on the ground seems fucking crazy to me now. Shit, they found people buried in barrels in this park. Anyway, the nest is positioned so I am facing the tree and overlooking the spacious fields of grass on either side of the street. I sit and watch the fog roll in from the beach, past the avenues, down Haight Street, all the way to Divisadero where it stops, mysteriously. When lying in the nest, one must stay on his or her back, in the position of a person who is sliding off a couch, or kicked back in a recliner. It's not an altogether uncomfortable position to sleep in, yet even with the sleeping bag and lounge chair cushion, my ass gets sore. Now that you know the tree and have a better idea of what we're dealing with here, I will begin relating my notes to you as I write them. Though I am safe up here from cops and murderers, there is one thing I fear more than anything else. Fire. You might think I'd be afraid of falling out of the nest, but that is actually the least of my worries. If I could only describe how safe and cradle-like my nest really is, I suppose you just have to lie in it. Anyhow, as safe as it seems, I'm sure it would go up in flames like a gasoline-soaked rag if someone were to drop a match and the dry brown needles piled around the trunk. I'd have no chance of escape. I mean, if I fell, I might catch on a branch and break my fall. If I was attacked, I might be able to fend off my attacker. If I were arrested, I'd get out of jail. But if there's a fire, I'm toast. I'd have to jump and it's a long way down. Feed the hungry, the lazy, the artist. Free food for the prisoners, the handicapped, and me. Plow, farmers, grow us our rice and beans. I'm on the team. I need your protein like you need the land. Bad. Cook, old woman. Soften those legumes for my omnivorous palate and spice them well. I'll wait here in my cozy nest till they are done. The sidewalk cracks of my brain are opening to reveal the sights of my eyes. Understandably entertaining, I laugh and then sigh. Trapped in bleeding ditches with names each their own, 
a winking constellation that calls my head home. What I see is weird like LSD, Kool-Aid, old age, bloody pee. I see incestuous junkies hot on the rocks, skimming and flipping from warrens and flocks. I see angels shriek and demons snicker as the hunter aims and pulls the trigger. Girls going to school in packs on the street, stores selling peanuts, candies, and meat. I see lightning and black clouds with linings of gold, fat fags and idiots, some young and some old. I see words sprayed on pages like dried brains or snot. I see a lifetime of questions all answered with pot. It's early and I can't go back to sleep. I've been hungry since last night, but now the nauseous wave of hunger hits hard. It's 5 o'clock a.m. and I've decided to make the pilgrimage to St. Martin de Porres, the only early morning soup kitchen. Breakfast is the same every morning. Oatmeal with raisins, bread, coffee. Makes me feel like I'm living in the Great Depression. I always thought they should call it St. Martin de Porridge, you know, just to lighten the air of the joint. So I pack a pipe load to smoke before I leave. Hey, it's a long walk to Potrero in 16th. And think about my lyrics to the song Soup Kitchen. Vicious circles got me down. I'm ruled only by the pain in my gut. The nagging reality of hunger is always near. So near, in fact, that I tend to overeat at every chance, which only serves in stretching my belly and multiplying the effect of the nauseous wave. Talk about vicious circles. I'm on my third styrofoam cup full of coffee, all you can drink and eat here at St. Martin de Porres. As I scan the crowd, not a lot of familiar faces and no punks at all. Back when they served from, from a building on 24th and Florida, I used to know all the bagman faces. The old Ham's Beer Brewery where I lived back then was only a few blocks away, making it more economical to eat there than at the Zoop Kitchen all the way up Haight. So this morning is almost like old times for me, except all the old bag men have been replaced by new ones. Also, the punks don't frequent the place anymore. Everyone hangs out in the hate now. Back when the compound was happening and gigs all the time at the tool and die, the mission was jumping. With the closing of the vats, all that came to an abrupt end. But that's a whole other story. Besides this place and the Zoop Kitchen, I also visit a handful of other free kitchens whenever the need arises. I've heard there are no less than 20 different meals served each day in San Francisco for free. I try and stick to the vegetarian meals which are not religion oriented, in other words, they don't make you pray. But there is one meal which I can't pass up and that is the weekly feast at the Hare Krishna temple. I always wait outside until they finish dancing and chanting, then when the food is served, I take off my shoes and rush in to take my place among the other cross-legged bodies. What comes next is a hassle-free, ten-course meal, all you can eat. The bald devotees try and convert me now and then, but I've heard the spiel before. Sorry, I don't believe in blue men. The ultimate meal is Saturday afternoons. A household on SSI prepares a grand vegetarian feast and serves it in wild outfits. All you can eat of any dish they have. They have herb tea, yeast, soy sauce, and everything. Crazy. Last night, as I lay in my bag listening to tapes, I had a scary thought. Maybe because it's almost Halloween, two more days, or because I've seen too many horror movies, I'm not sure. But anyway, I thought how horrifying it would be if some crazy guy climbed up the tree, I wouldn't hear him because I've got my headphones on and blasting, and grabbed me from underneath. I think I'd be so shocked I'd faint. I would be trapped in the bag so I wouldn't be able to kick at him, and if he had a knife, well then forget it. As I lay there imagining all the scary, terrible things that could happen to me, I actually did hear a noise against the trunk about 20 feet below me. I froze as I listened closer. I had, by this time, turned off the cassette player and removed the headphones. A scratching against the trunk sounded larger than a squirrel. I turned quickly, and, as I did, off flew the large owl, probably more startled than I was. I had forgotten about the owl because I had never actually seen it before. In the morning, I noticed fresh, big, healthy owl shit 
on the bored slats of its roost. After putting up my gear, I climbed down. Once under the tree, I walked around surveying the visibility of my catch from every angle. Standing on the side of the tree opposite the street, I noticed a brown squirrel climbing up toward my nest. Upon reaching the nest, it seemed to inspect my equipment, wrinkling its nose and glancing about suspiciously. I made some squirrel noises and it scampered higher up, out of sight. I need to bring some nuts when I return. Who knows, I could have them eating out of my hands or even sleeping with me in a few weeks. Me and a whole family of squirrels, living in my sleeping bag. They would keep me warm by wrapping around my neck at night, just like cats. Ah, daydreaming. It's raining now and I'm downtown trying to collect some money. Practice was canceled by our drummer, Felix. I need to get this money and get back to the nest. I just got back from the 5 p.m. soup kitchen on Valencia. I usually never go there, but when I'm broke and hungry, I'll take what I can get and be glad of it. The nun served me chicken soup and sausage. Disgusting. I almost got into a fight with a drunk who wrongly accused me of cutting in line. He ended the argument by telling me to get a job. On my way over here, an alley near Fell and Goff, I stopped at the Museum of Modern Art, but finding the giant gallery closed, I took a shit in the bushes facing the street. While squatting there, I studied the newspaper beds laid out even here and wondered which bums slept here in night train stupors as respectable citizens hurried by on their way to important meetings. Suit and tie guy with his fashion phases and his quarterly raises feels he's better than you or me. Suit and tie guy thinks he's real cute in the bathroom for a toot until his nose starts to bleed. Suit and tie guy, I see he always hurries. I know he always worries. He's gonna die of a heart attack. Suit and tie guy, on his way to feeding or an important meeting, just like a car on a track. Suit and tie guy, in between stations with certain destinations, never varying from that routine. Suit and tie guy, and he'll tell you in one word that he is insured and it's not as bad as it may seem. In a half hour, I must get up and walk a block to the apartment where I work part-time for a jeweler. When I called this morning, Susan said she might have some of the money she owes me plus a couple of hours of work. My work usually begins with changing the kitty litter boxes, taking the garbage down, then sweeping and mopping the house. Once all that is complete, then I can start sanding the little plastic beads in the sink. All this for five bucks an hour, weed money. For right now though, I'm still a lost poet out in the cold, nowhere to go except the tree unless I wanna pay money to sit in a restaurant. So I sit here in the back alley, piss smell and smoke my weed in solitude. I first learned to make jewelry down in Mexico where I lived and went to school for a year. Back then it was part of my plan to become an honorable goldsmith with my own shop and all. I even bought a bunch of supplies which I sold for cheap as I did all my other possessions, needing gas money to get to Frisco with the band on our first ever excursion out of the state. Mexico on my mind. Flipping third class bus wreck on stone late night Pachutla to Oaxaca Express. Almost off a cliff of the severe sheer Sierra Madre mother mountain range. Fresh squeezed by street vendor sugarcane juice. Carrot juice so cheap I live on it. Zipolite, Beach of the Dead, where French Canadians and lonely Americans smoke cheap weed under thatched, sandy-floored palapas, unmolested by marinos, and eating black beans with fried fish, fresh, just brought in by tan locals in fiberglass outboards, barely big enough, it seems, to carry their turtle, shark, tuna, catches back to calm inlets, Puerto Angel or St. Augustine where they have the turtle processing plant stinking of awful silent reptile death. Tons of shells stacked up to later be used as fertilizer, but only after first being ground to mulch in the giant turtle shell grinder situated in the back of the plant, man. Mad Mexico, seedy, maybe false fun, drunk with friends, whorehouse nights, endurance testing train rides from dirty Laredo to clean San Miguel de Allende, scattered there on the hillside like a mini San Francisco. San Miguel is where I attended classes. I love that little steep city. Just a bus ride away is Guanajuato, one time richest city in the world, 
and they got the mummies to prove it. Mexico. Susan wasn't home. Black heart. Shrunken. Bent. Ruined. I need privacy. I'm ugly. I still have shame. What I lack in pride and dignity, I make up for in my shyness. It's starting to rain. I'm sitting and drinking a beer bought reluctantly with my last dollar. I must now make my way back to the nest. Manifest destiny, more blood on the hands of Christ. They called themselves Christians and gave themselves the rights. Disguised as missionaries, they were really after gold. Many Indians died for that, how many's never told. Forever moving onward, said they were guided from above, actually driven by hate, disguised as love. But all their false love can't disguise true hate and the racist diplomacy of the church and the state. Now the church must be rich with all that gold, but they'll never return all that they stole. It sits in a vault built just for gold, and there it will sit forever because it never gets old. Manifest destiny. I'm here in the nest again. Below me, in the abandoned toolbox, there are several people crashing out. They scared the living shit out of me, and furthermore, could be a serious risk to the security of my pad. There was no moon as I approached the tree earlier, pitch black. I took a shit about 20 yards away. As I pulled the low-hanging branches apart, and entered the tent-like area under the natural canopy, I heard voices and froze. At first, I was positive they were in the tree. I noticed trash or something scattered about, but couldn't make the objects out, and it was even darker under the tree than it was out in the field. I stayed glued to the same spot as I listened to the muffled whispers, which by now sounded as if they were coming from some point a little ways beyond the tree. My heart was going like crazy as I considered the possibility that this may be my junk strewn about and the culprits may still be in the nest at this moment. My only weapon, the morning star I bought at the flea market, was up there hanging from a branch within handy reach of anyone sitting in the nest. Right then, I heard one of the voices say he wished he had a gun, which was followed by shushing sounds seemingly made by a woman. I wasn't sure if they'd heard me, so I slowly and quietly backed up and went back out into the field. I thought for a while about what I should do. Then it dawned on me. The box! They were in the box! The trash on the ground was the trash from inside the box. A few of the acid casualties had almost got the idea. They'd made the first major move from the cardboard bed to the eventual retroactive counter-evolutionary move to the trees. I knew it would be risky to climb the tree now, but basically I had nowhere else to go. So I climbed it, and here I am. Now I'm going to sleep. Good night. Pain to play. I've lived in a van, and I've lived in a tree. Never did what anyone expected of me. I ate at soup kitchens and slept in squats, abandoned buildings and parking lots. I borrowed money and played for free living in America in poverty. I was always hungry, tense and weird, trench coat, mange, half a beard. I slept on park benches and I'll never forget the cold and rain and all that shit. Everyone with money and me with none. When you don't have any, it's not much fun. Pain to play. Today is Sunday. The Zoop Kitchen, which serves from a large hall rented out by the connecting church, can't serve today for obvious reasons. On Divisadero Street, however, the One Mind Temple serves, at 3 o'clock, a healthy feast of rice and beans. So I slept late and woke up to a field full of volleyball players and jogging by jerks. Cars lined both sides of the street. Everywhere there were people, frisbees flying, sun tanners bathing in the bright sun. I don't know how I slept through the arrival of all these yuppies. I guess I sleep pretty deep up here, even though I'm used to sleeping on my side and not my back. On my way back from practice, I stopped and got a super vegetarian burrito from a shop in the Upper Haight and ate it while walking towards the nest. I finished the last sour cream drenched bite as I arrived at the half-lit tennis courts where I am writing this. There's a drinking fountain here where I brush my teeth at night, 
because the toilets get locked up at 6. This is almost like living at a resort. Like, right nearby are the lawn bowling courts where, during the day, old folks roll lopsided wooden balls on closely cropped lawns for sport. There are also museums here, a rose garden, and even a buffalo ranch. Let's see, what else? Fly casting ponds, redwoods, eucalyptus trees, psychedelic mushrooms, a band shell where they hold free concerts, and the wonderful Hall of Man aquarium building, which is very close to the nest. Every first Wednesday of the month, the entrance is free, and if I'm around and I remember, I go check out all the fish, snakes, stuffed animals, alligators, penguins, and seals. Two nights ago, I slept at Joan's parents' house, the woman who gave me the sleeping bag. I met her back when my brother lived on Fillmore Street in his wife's manicuring shop. Joan was my sister-in-law's only employee. The other night, she said she may have a lead on a job making designer jewelry over in Oakland. I hadn't thought about getting a full-time job, but taking all things into consideration, winter coming, rain, no more gigs for a while, practicing for our next album, and with Susan having less and less work for me, fuck, man, I might have to. I should know in a few days whether or not they need any help. The designers, who own the shop, by the way, are the parents of the drummer in a band that toured with us on the Midwest leg of our last journey, the Boneless Ones. Joan, who I should call Saint Joan, said I could stay at her parents' house whenever I need to. It's nice to have a place to take a shower and all. I gently peel back the petals of your passionate flower and sample sweet nectar, discover secret places, inspect warm, slick creases, an electric paint gash of human necessity, massage your monthly wound, and replace eons of pain with a moment of pleasure. I probe your deep device, hot and alive. We got the job. My boss is cool and said I could take off early for practice. I told him about touring and he said that was okay too. I got paid on my first day so I'll have train fare for the next week. My boss doesn't know I live in a tree. I told him I stayed with a friend in SF, which isn't really a lie. Joan has been wanting to move out of her parents, so we've been talking about renting a room somewhere near work. I am integrating myself back into the society I so shun. My days are numbered now here in this tree. I'll never get to use the big rain tarp I found in a coffee shop yesterday. A customer left it behind, so I snagged it. I had planned on tying it up through the reinforced eyelets with rope as a barrier against the wind and rain. Last night I had a dream that there were tons of people in hammocks hanging from the trees all around me. A whole society of tree dwellers were my neighbors. Just a dream though. There's only me here. Late at night I can hear other people talking in the bushes. A constant reminder that this park is full of people sleeping every night. Once I awoke from a dream, I guess, thinking there was a group of people climbing the tree. I reached for my mace-like ball and chain before I realized I was only imagining things. Anybody tries and get up this tree and they'll get a head full of deep dents. Every now and then I wake up in the middle of the night and I need to take a piss. Rather than climb all the way down, I just climb to the other side of the tree and let her rip, being careful to avoid the limbs which I used to climb on. Once I had to take a shit, so I climbed down to the owl's nest and dumped my load right in his living room. I felt no regrets because he shits there too. He's got a pretty big pad. I don't trust it though because the whole contraption is balanced on one limb and supported only by ropes and nails. All in all, I prefer the natural web of branches which makes up my nest to the man-made nest down below. I could sleep down there if I reinforced the supports and cleaned it all out, but why bother? I guess I've been pretty lucky so far that it hasn't rained hard or even gotten very windy as it often does here in San Francisco. When the wind does blow hard, all the branches rub together and the tree sings out in roaring discord and, along with hundreds of other trees in the park, performs a loud symphony, a deafening sonic blast of indistinguishable scrapes, whistles, grinds, grates, and swooshes. My tree is like a giant hairy fiddler with a thousand arms and fiddles, all out of tune and off-key. They play hard, straining and sometimes breaking with the strain. 
it's impossible to sleep up here when the wind's blowing like that. So, like I've said, I've been lucky. I have to get up early now, 6.30, and walk to the bus stop on Haight, where I catch the 7 to Civic Center. The BART station is underground there, so I descend the stairs and insert my magnetically coded ticket into the computerized turnstile. Once on the train, I read or write for the 15 minutes of the ride to Lake Merritt Station. So much cruelty and madness in these days of despair. The terror in which we wait for the end of the world. Terror which haunts the human soul. When will the world explode? Mother Earth wept as they tore off her dress. Heartbroken and humiliated in a state of distress, they ripped out her hair and scratched at her skin, drained her of fluids, then committed their sin. They gouged out her eyes and cauterized her womb, sealed up her mouth and made her a tomb. They took from her like children, giving little in return, except oceans of shit and radiation burn. Now she lies still, at the mercy of man. I whisper in her ear, that's not the way I am. A few nights ago, en route to show Joan my pad, we heard a cat meowing from the bushes on the other side of the street. It sounded distressed, and both of us being cat lovers, we followed the calls till we found some bushes which the sound seemed to be coming from. Suddenly, I looked up and realized it was up in a tree directly above the bushes where we thought it was. We tried to coax the worried cat down, but to no avail. I made up my mind to climb out on a large dead limb where I could reach it easier. I shimmied my way out on the limb as Joan watched from below, undoubtedly thinking, what a date this has turned out to be. Just as I suggested to her that she move out from under the limb, it crashed down and me with it, right where Joan had been standing. I wasn't hurt, but the cat still called pitifully. Up went Joan on my shoulders. She is very thin and light, easy to lift and carry to the spot under the cat from which she plucked the relieved little guy from the clutches of the evil cat-eating tree. We took the young cat back to the tree where I live. I put him on my back and climbed to the nest with not much of a problem. At first I thought he might fall, but when I tried to take him off once I reached the nest, I realized he's not going anywhere. I almost had to send Joan for the fucking crowbar. Anyway, Joan and I, like proud parents, laid in the nest, her in my lap, and the cat in hers for an hour. Joan fell asleep for about 15 minutes or so. Then we decided to drive down to Cala Foods on Haight and buy some cat food. On the way to the store, we discussed a large lump we had felt on his stomach. The cat seemed to not be in any great pain, but we were still worried. Joan dropped me off with the food, three gourmet cans with pop and peel tops, and I mobbed back up to the nest where my new cat was waiting, marching and purring as loud as a little tractor on my sleeping bag. He ate the can of food voraciously, very primal, primitive hunger. I had the feeling he would have torn my eyes out if I tried to take it back from him. Then I started thinking, what if he needs to take a shit? I forgot to bring him water. Forget the water, that'll just make him piss. After he ate, he groomed his fur till I fell asleep. At that time, I still didn't know what he looked like because it was so dark, still no moon in sight. But when I woke up, I found one of the finest young cats I've ever seen. A magnificent tabby, long-haired, a Maine coon cat. Someone dumped him, no doubt, because of his defect. I took him to the ground with me so he could crap if he needed to. He didn't do it right away, so I fed him another can. Then, while he was eating, I slipped away. We'd started practicing for our new album, and about 9.30, I got back to the nest. Kitty, 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 I chattered. A few seconds later, I heard a response, and he came charging out of the underbrush, meowing like mad. I popped the third and last can for him and then climbed to the tree and crashed. In the morning, I found him up in a little tree nearby, stuck, of course, probably chased there by a dog. I pulled him down, then decided to take him over to Susan's apartment. She has two cats already, so maybe she'll take a third. I called her from a payphone, and miraculously, she gives me the okay to bring him on over. Apparently, she knows a vet who may fix his stomach for free and then find a home for him. On the way to her apartment, I realized he had shit all over himself and me. It must have happened when he saw that big dog in the park. He started clawing at me trying to get away. All he would have done was climb another tree and get stuck again. I stopped and scraped most of it off with a stick, 
but his ass was all soaked with it. So, after I dropped him off, I walked to Civic Center and caught the BART to work. Then, that night, we left to L.A. for a big Olympic show with Slayer. Gary Tovar set it up, and it is Slayer's first show since the release of their new LP. We all piled into Betsy, our 77 Chevy van, and took off down Highway 5. Deal with it. Somehow you've avoided the questions at hand. Are you happy? And is your band? There's no future in failure, no fortune in fun. You'd better wake up and deal with it, son. You think you're somebody you've never been. Just because you loved Barbie doesn't mean you are kin. In fact, you're just as ugly as you always were. You seem undecided. I've always been sure. Now you owe your family and your band. Your life's become a drag you can't stand. You're sinking deeper and deeper into debt. Frustration builds. You feel upset. Anger rages. You feel like a fight. Top ramen noodles for another night. And things don't get better. They only get worse. Your mind turns to crime and some lady's purse. Deal with it. And I don't mean with drugs that only numb your feeling. I don't want to be the one who has to scrape you off the ceiling. Deal with yourself. You are an extremely soft machine. Take care of yourself. You know what I mean. Deal with it. The pit that night was insanity at its finest. Skinheads and long-haired metalheads thrashed together with the punks in a frenzy of sour-smelling, sweaty, head-walking, stage-diving, chicken-fighting mayhem. Looked like maddened, wildest Indians from outer space come to powwow on acid or something. Young men staggered along with the circle holding their heads in mock agony. Girls whirled through with scissoring elbows and multicolored hair. Tattooed shirtless skins walked the circle waiting for someone to bump into one of them so they could break their jaw. The scene that night was undoubtedly the craziest social cultural phenomenon on earth. Besides that one tribe where they beat each other on the head with these long poles. I saw it on National Geographic. In the pit. The band kicks in. They begin to rage. No man's land in front of the stage. Posers in the bathroom still looking at their hair. Thrashers in the foreground doing what they dare in the pit. Thrashing and slamming like hell in the pit. Tomorrow they know may not come. Banging and moshing like they don't give a shit. To the rapid beat of the drum. A boot to your forehead. A knee in your face. Your nose and lips start to bleed. Like a wild Indian from outer space drunk and high on weed. Guitar seems so fucking loud, people walking on the crowd, diving off the PA stacks, breaking ankles, necks, and backs. Then the circle begins in the thrashing pit. Fists are flying, people are getting hit. Tooth chippers left and right, skinheads in another fight, banging heads and broken jaws because there are no laws in the pit. Then you start thrashing like never before, stage diving, head walking like mad. Doing your thing all over the floor the best time that you've ever had. You are hurt all over but can't feel a thing. Not until the next day. Then you wake up stiff as a board and the pain won't go away. At one time during the opening act, I found myself caught up in the mad dance. Last maybe dance of mine or anyone else's life. So I made the best of it. Pushed to the front near the stage pogoed over the front light of headbangers, and with a somersault, landed on stage amidst the lights and band action. Then off I went like a rocket, landing on the sea of heads and rolled to the border of the pit, where I was again whipped into the thrashing whirlpool. The floor of the pit was sweaty gray cement, made slicker even by the spilled beer. Now and then some unfortunate soul fell into the muck, usually causing a pileup. There was major head walking that night. I saw some people run off the stage and get six or seven steps before missing. Pulling out of the literal human freeway which lurched and swirled spasmodically in a long free form oval, I turned sideways, followed my shoulder, and plowed through the densely packed crowd around the PA stacks. I made my way backstage with little resistance from the brutish bouncers since I was in the next band to play and flashed my stick on backstage pass to prove it. I headed backstage where our guitar player Spike and bass player Josh were tuning up. 
The opening band came in sweating and asked me who drank all their beer. Odie, our drunken roadie, had already begun setting up our equipment as the other band's roadie tore theirs down. I took the last few swigs of my orange juice, spirulina, bee pollen, royal jelly, ginseng drink. The butterflies were on the rampage, so I killed a Budweiser as I walked up to the stage. The lights had grown dim, and the taped music playing through the PA was turned off. I yawned and was overtaken by a last-minute sleepy feeling I always get right before a show. Voice Your Opinion We bring you all together to have a good time. Slam dance madness to music and a rhyme. If you're getting into it, give us a sign. I said, how are you doing? We're doing just fine. Positively flabbergasted at the thought of being here tonight. After hours in the van, you're such a pretty sight. A gathering of imbeciles reacting appropriately, stage diving, head walking into infinity. Voice your opinion. Can you make sense out of this? I doubt it. Can you hear what I say when I shout it? Voice your opinion. Make your thoughts known. Say what you mean. You better mean what you say because someday you may have to pay the cost for what you believe to be right. You may have to fight. Voice your opinion. Sometime during our set, the pit metamorphosized into four separate pits. Front center was the skinhead pit. I witnessed with absolute horror and revulsion as hapless victims were undeservingly slaughtered for accidentally stepping into the wrong pit. The real, sad, segregated secret society unfolded before me in startling living color. I saw lots of people porking it out. Suicidals against the skins, skins against the metalheads, insane violence on a larger scale than I ever imagined. Headwalking. I'm going to ask you a question, so if you could answer, please. What in the heck is fun and why can't I have any? A group of people laughing, they must be having fun. A group of people starving, they are having none. Throw a brick at a cop car driving down the street. Would that be fun? Would that feel neat? On the beach, the pretty ladies, basking in the sun. I don't see them laughing, but they must be having fun. And what about the preacher, or the pope, or a nun? What do they do on a Saturday night? How do they have fun? Are sports fun? To chase after and tackle someone? Is sex fun? Are drugs fun? Is sleep fun? Is food fun? Is money fun? To spend or just to have some? And what about the mass murderer? He killed dozens with a gun. Could that be his own personal way of having fun? Fuck that. Headwalking. Headwalking. Headwalking is fun. So stiffen up your necks, all you people on the floor. What do you think you were out there for? Yeah, I'm walking on your head, dick. Sure, you must think I'm sick. But just try it. It's fun. Walking on everyone. Headwalking. Head walking. Slayer killed as usual. Twice as loud as the opening acts, they had two giant upside down crosses that lit up as their new backdrop. We partied that night and drove home the next day. I had Odie drop me off near the nest. It was already dark and still no moon. I felt very odd as I approached the tree. After all, here I am, a 25 year old man, singer for a hardcore thrash band living in a tree. We sold 400 shirts at that show, and I didn't get a penny of it. Fuck, I owe money to the band. The money I was supposed to get for this show only partly paid for my debt. But I had work in the morning, and I would get a paycheck on Wednesday. Once Joan and I got our paychecks, we can move into the room that a friend of Joan's has for rent in a house off MacArthur in Fruitvale. I felt strange because I had been gone for two nights and I was worried that those people in the box beneath the tree may have moved up to the nest. Anyone could be up there. As I began climbing the tree, my worst fears were confirmed. Noises, accompanied by a rain of bark and dry needles, sounded like squirrels up there or maybe the owl. I kept on climbing because I figured that if it was the owl, then it would fly off, and if it was squirrels, then they would run away. When I got to the nest, I found it vacant. Whatever it was that was making the noises had moved up to the top of the tree. I got into my sleeping bag and smoked some resin from my pipe, as I had no weed. 
Soon, bark and needles began falling on my face, and I started getting really scared. I lit my Bic lighter and held it at arm's length, but still couldn't see where the noises were coming from. It sounded big, whatever it was, and I didn't rule out the possibility that it could be a human. After a few minutes, I could see the branches moving directly above me, but still couldn't see what was causing the disturbance. I flicked my lighter again, and there it was, a huge black cat, tail twitching, ears flat, hissing at me in a spitting feral challenge. I hissed back, but it bunched itself up like it was getting ready to jump down on me, so I ducked down in my sleeping bag like a scared baby. Hell, it could have had rabies or something, or be a demon from the underworld sent to watch me like that big crow or those devil dogs in the omen. While lying there helpless and shaking like a leaf, I listened closely to the noise the cat was making. I soon realized there was not one, but several cats above me. My imagination ran wild as I thought of all the possibilities involving the eventual outcome of this situation. About a half hour passed before the cats came down to the limbs I was on. Growling deep in their throats, they each came down and inspected my large, shapeless, slug-like form. I could hear them inches from my ear and even feel them walking on the limbs around me. I was terrified, but also extremely interested, probably because I'm such a cat lover and had always had cats and never really been scared of one before. After a few more minutes, the noises started above me again as before, and I realized they had no intention of leaving the tree and, furthermore, were obviously not in the least bit afraid of me. I then decided to put my foot down, so to speak, so I could get some sleep. Now it was my turn to get pissed off. I broke out of that bag like a madman. With a screeching yell, I lit my ineffectual lighter with one hand and grabbed my spike ball and chain with the other. I wailed on the surrounding branches with the morning star and kept yelling the whole time for added effect. I heard them scatter in what seemed like three different directions. About three minutes later, I heard the last one jump to the ground. I smoked some more resin just to calm down. I thought about why the cats were up there, then remembered that I had fed the cat that Joan and I found up there. I finally went to sleep after lying and thinking for a long time about all sorts of stuff, everything. Eight hours later, I awoke completely rested and went to work. I am writing this on the BART train, but we are now approaching my stop. Here's a song I wrote on the bus about last night's wicked encounter. Prince of Darkness. He's the grand master of a zillion disguises, loyal companion of the lonely old one-eyed Jack. He never bothers making compromises. He's waiting to stick you in the soft of your back. Prince of Darkness, angel of evil, fallen angel, evil angel of hell. Black cat watching from his nest in your trees, through the window when you take a shower. I can't tell you exactly what he sees. He has not yet given me the power. He doesn't know the beauty of laughter or about how to make a smile. After all, it is you he is after, you and that girl, your child. He watches her from underwater in that murky lake where they swim. It was he in the back seat with her the other night on her date with Tim. And he's always there at every meal. He knows about your secret lies, and he knows more than you how you feel when you look at her teenage thighs. He's the vermin who's been in your pantry, disgusting grubs spoiling all of your food. He was the one at your party who got so drunk and was so lewd. He broke into your hen house. He was out there fucking your hens, and he's been in your neighbor's house, killing your friends. Prince of Darkness, Angel of Evil, Fallen Angel, Evil Angel of Hell. Well, this story has passed its climax, I'd say, and is quickly coming to an abrupt end. As Joan has informed me that we've got the room in Fruitvale if we want it. I'm writing this bit while Joan and I eat our slices of pizza at the pizza joint where we always eat our lunch on work days. Here's another poem. Mangy Dog and I look the same. But you don't know what goes on inside my brain. Ugly thoughts. But I'm sure you've had your share. I'm interested in what goes on within. I write or draw it with a pen and try to figure it out from there. Climbing trees to sit or live, hand out to take what they give. No is not in my vocabulary. 
sleeping in the park alone. So many weirdos, at least I'm stoned. Only the animals are scary. Rabid dogs, owls, and cats. Big as dog, rats, and bats. I know the real meaning of fear. But I've got my spiked ball and chain. Gonna knock out somebody's brain if they come at me from the rear. I crap here where and when I like, even on the path where people hike. It makes no difference to me. Now down the path a man will jog, think to himself, what a large dog, and never look up at the tree. Tonight is my last night in the tree. We got the room, as you've most likely guessed, and are moving in tomorrow. I could have slept at Joan's house tonight, but wanted one last night out. One last night in the nest. Haikus. Disodium Rome. Houstonian Four. A bad mad. A hot miasma. I slightly rise. A sweet fart. Cold lost poet. Once alone. Now not. Unfathomable future. Soup kitchen closed. Help. Screaming words. Ears of corn, wasted wisdom. A hard life, an easy day, I rejoice with beer. Pitch black, no moon, cough and sigh. Packing my pipe, searching for my lighter, it's gone. Above all, monkey-like man, perched in tree. Squirrel creature, climbs to nest. Alone at last. I hate my head, ugly eyed nub, out of order. <laughs>